Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Tanya and today I'm going to do a reaction video for you. So today I'm going to react to Lost in the Pond, um, who I have reacted to on my channel a couple times before. Um, and uh, I've said in those videos that I typically watch uh, this channel in my own time, but sometimes some of his videos um, are like the perfect types of videos to react to. And he has plenty of videos on his channel that I still haven't seen yet. And I found this one from nine months ago. This one is called Why American English is Highly Misunderstood. And so I thought this sounded like an interesting video, something that might be kind of fun to react to. Um, so I was hoping that you guys might enjoy this too. Lawrence's uh, sense of humor, his dry British sense of humor, I just love it so much. Um, so I just really enjoy watching his, his channel. He's also really smart and um, I, I just, I love how well put together his videos are and stuff. Also, there's no Cody here right now because he is asleep in the other room. Um, I do have Tika laying here next to me, but I don't know if I'd be able to move my camera to show you. <laughs> Here's Tika. <laughs> Before we get started on this video, I just want to remind everybody that I turned on my memberships. So if anyone is interested in uh, joining my memberships to help support my channel, um, the option is there. There's only one tier so far. So yeah, it's there if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started on this video. Okay, here we go. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond. And one of those memos pertains to the English language. In this case, American English. Now I'll be honest, you won't hear too many English people say what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. American English is fascinating. And as a former linguistics student who once lived in Britain, I often felt compelled to defend it. You see, I've always been wary of groupthink. Groupthink is when a collection of individuals arrive at a consensus, even when it's at odds with the facts. I think the British tendency to ridicule American English might be spurred on by groupthink, but also British humour but also confirmation bias. To us, America is this big dog who likes to proclaim itself the greatest country in the world at the same time as policing it. Therefore, we think, it must be that this same hubris drove America to come up with new words and spellings. Why else do we suddenly remain silent when it's Australia referring to football as soccer? Indeed, the fact that the British came up with the word is I mean, often overlooked. It is true that um, there are more than just, just Americans that call um, soccer soccer there are other countries who do it but we are the only ones who get like shit for it that is true because in the heat of social media combat this goes against our agenda but having studied american english extensively i'm amazed at how little this agenda holds up to scrutiny anybody who's seen my youtube shorts can attest to that to me, the story of American English, much like the story of language in general, is highly compelling. Some have even said the same thing about my videos, so if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, do that now. In the meantime, let's take a look at how we've been getting American English wrong, starting with this. Contrary to what you may have heard, a lot of American English is actually pretty similar to the English of my homeland, at least as it was in the 1600s. You see, it's been said that some present-day Americans actually talk a bit like how William Shakespeare might have spoken when he wasn't being portrayed by Ray Fiennes' brother. And I don't mean that Americans go around saying things like, How art thou, buddy, with thyself care for a goblet of fair cores light? I mean that common properties of American English are closer to that of 17th century English people than they are to those of the present day. I've actually heard this fact before that um, hundreds of years ago that the English uh, po possibly did sound a lot more American than, uh, the, the, than the way they sound now. When you think about it, this makes sense. The first successful permanent English settlement in America was in 1607, the same year Shakespeare completed Antony and Cleopatra. Perhaps the most notable characteristic that modern-day Americans share with early 17th century English people is roticity. Roticity specifically relates to the pronunciation of R. Most Americans today sound out the R in words like far, whereas most English people don't. However, back in 1620, England was rich with rhotic accents. Some actors of the time might even have articulated the R's in Wherefore art thou, Romeo? 
But even at that point in history, there were signs that roticity in England was beginning to crack. Playwright Ben Jonson, a contemporary of Shakespeare's, noted in the 1630s that the letter R sounded firm in the beginning of words and more liquid in the middle and ends. I don't know, he probably didn't have that accent. More than a century later, it was disappearing so fast among speakers in London that Americans returning to England after the Revolutionary War noticed its absence. And the decline of England's roticity has even continued on during my own lifetime, with the fire pronunciation today largely confined to the West country. Meanwhile, in America, just as in Scotland and Ireland, the post-vocalic R is stronger than ever. But this doesn't mean that it hasn't been tested. In the 18th and 19th centuries, several port cities with commercial ties to Britain were influenced by England's newfound R-less pronunciation, to the extent that some people in, say, Boston and Savannah still pronounce it far. I was just going to say, there are um, areas in America who um, are less rhotic, so... <clears throat> Uh, like he said, in Boston, um, I mean, I'm sure most people know a Boston accent and like the, like the, the phrase that everyone says is pack the car or pack the car and have a yard, whatever, however it goes. But there's also like some, um, states in the South that kind of drop it also. Um, <clears throat> and he might, I don't know if he's going to mention it here or not but um but yeah there are southern there are southerners who do that too today and up until world war ii non-roticity was a common feature of america's mid-atlantic accent a prestigious way of talking among actors and broadcasters during the early 20th century but on the whole the same linguistic transformation witnessed in england did not occur in the u.s before I actually moved to the United States, I'm not sure I realised the extent to which our two countries differed on one thing in particular. Homophones. A homophone is when two or more words are pronounced the exact same way but possess a different meaning and sometimes spelling. One example of my own is how I identically pronounce poor as in downpour and poor as in my dog's paw. Doggy. In the United States, roticity means that this particular homophone is highly uncommon, with poor and pa highly distinct. Instead, many of the homophones I've encountered in America were the result of phonetic mergers in which cot and corp develop the same pronunciation in some regions. Moreover, approximately 57% of Americans make no phonetic distinction between the three M words in the following sentence. George wished to marry Mary while he was married. Imagine the wedding speech. He's actually said that in one of his videos before the whole Mary, Mary, Mary thing. And um, I think I think the one that I saw him talking about that, his wife was in the video and he was having her say it the way she says it because she's American. And then he was saying it the way he says it. Um, I think it's like similar with the word Harry also. But yeah, we do say Mary. Well, I would say most Americans do say Mary, Mary, Mary all the same way. Which is seven pints in. Often when debates arise over British versus American English, a common British retort is this. We invented the language, so our way is correct. But that retort ignores the fact that English was technically created by Germanic people 1500 years ago. It also conveniently overlooks the fact that English borrowed heavily from countless other languages like French, Latin or Arabic. And one thing that I've seen repeatedly while making shorts on the topic is this. American alterations are often made precisely with these origins in mind. I mean, sure, Versailles, Indiana might not sound too much like the French palace that inspired it. But then, you know, if there's one area in which Americans make up their own rules, it's place names. However, given the UK existence of Worcester, Chiswick and... W I can't remember how to say that. The two countries might have cause for common ground. But very often, everyday Americanisms, like the spelling of licorice, won out because they more closely match the older words from which they were derived. In many ways, it has less to do with getting one over the British and more to do with injecting consistency into an otherwise inconsistent language. Neither country comes remotely close to realising that dream, but I applaud Americans for trying.
From experience, it's difficult to comprehend all of the regional nuances of American English without actually living here. In fact, I've been told by plenty of Americans quite believably that the same is true of Britain. The problem is when you're commenting... Yeah, I mean, there was a video that was going around a few years ago that um, a lot of reactors were reacting to, and it was the guy who... Um, was like a linguist or something and he he was talking about the different regions of the u.s and the different accents and he was like he's really good at like doing all the different accents as well um and a lot of people reacted to that video the thing is about that video is like he even said that there's no way he can like do a video on every single accent in in america because there's so many different accents that people don't even realize i mean most people probably think that all we have is like New York, Boston, and the South. And those are the only accents that America has. But there are, like just even in my own state of Illinois, there are so many different accents in, in just the state alone. Just because we're from Illinois doesn't mean that we sound like we're from Chicago. And I'm not from Chicago. I'm like two, three hours south of Chicago. So... Um, I, I feel like I sound way different than people from Chicago. Um, but then there are people who live even further south than me who sound um, more so like they're from Kentucky or something. So there, there's many different accents. From afar, all you've got to go on is what you hear in film and television. And the problem with that is that both seem to create an illusion that between them, Britain and America share about six dialects. In reality, rough estimates put the number of combined major dialects at around 70. I was not surprised to discover that more than half of them came from Britain, where you can barely drive 50 miles before hearing a new word for chewing gum. But younger me would have been stunned to learn that the United States is home to more than 30 major English dialects of its own, not to mention countless sub-dialects. Of course, in such a large country, this means that you might drive hundreds of miles before encountering major differences in the way people speak. But there are many exceptions to this rule. Take, for example, North Carolina, proclaimed by some to be the most linguistically diverse state in the Union. In fact, in addition to the dialects of Virginia Piedmont, North Carolina Piedmont, African American Vernacular English, North Carolina Coastal Plains, and Southern Appalachian Highlands, there's the curious case of high tide English. Spoken by only a couple of hundred people, when you hear it, something peculiar stands out. It almost sounds... British. Toy toy on the same side, high tide on the same side. In fact, the BBC perhaps described it best in 2019. It's like someone took Elizabethan English, sprinkled in some Irish tones and 1700 Scottish accents, then mixed it all up with pirate slang. They don't they don't speak like that on the BBC anymore. And that more or less describes the origins of high tide, or as speakers of it might say, hoy toyed, because well that I mean they sound like they're from Birmingham. <laughs> When we think of words that the United States gave to the English language, we often think of expressions we perceive as tired or overused. This can include words like awesome, even though Britain both uses it and introduced it. But the more I've looked into this, the more I've realized something unexpected. America is responsible for thousands of very common words that us Brits use without hesitation. Words like hello, okay, hangover, belittle, and teenager. And one common huh. denominator Whoa. between many such words is that upon entering the language in centuries past, they were soundly ridiculed by the British. In the case of belittle, a word coined by US President Thomas Jefferson, there's even recorded evidence for such a backlash. Belittle? What an expression! It may be an elegant one in Virginia, but for our part all we can do is to guess at its meaning. For shame, Mr. Jefferson. So what does this tell us? It tells us that distrust of other forms of English is nothing new. But it also tells us that Brits will lampoon Americanisms until we collectively forget that that's what they are. It's quite probable that the American origins of, say, sea to mean series, itself a recent addition to British English, will one day be lost to history. And speaking of history, English is a language more than 1500 years in the making. Along the way, words have come and gone, definitions have changed, and spellings have evolved beyond recognition. So just know that this will happen again, and that blame, if you want to call it that, will never solely rest on American shoulders. Unless we're talking about the word addicting. What is going on with that? If you haven't had a chance to watch my YouTube shorts, begin your binge by clicking here next and until the next video goodbye oh
Lawrence is always so fun to watch. I always learn things on his channel that, um, that I've never learned before. Although with this video, there was a lot in this video that I have heard before just because I did watch a lot of reactors uh, reacting to that one, um, that one video that got, that was so popular for a while, a couple years ago. But um, yeah, I always think that our languages are very fascinating too, between Americans, uh, the Brits, Australians, you know, any anyone who speaks the English language and um, the, the weird differences in Canadians and everything, like the weird differences between the way we say words, even though it's the same language. That's always been uh, kind of fascinating to me too. But um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Um, that's gonna do it for today. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, subscribe if you haven't done that yet, and I will see you next time. Some attention to my baby. Hi, babies. <laughs> I love you. Oh, <laughs> cute.